The study is going to be about cherubim. According to the Bible, what are cherubim? We're not going to get our information from old paintings. Uh, for starters, cherubim are not this. These are not cherubim, and they certainly aren't angels. You say, shh, not so loud. My mother-in-law has that painting. Well, so what? I've got an old poster of Spider-Man, but it's not scriptural either. So instead of trying to find out what cherubim are from paintings drawn by perverts who couldn't get enough child pornography, let's pretend that you are a brand new Christian. You got saved last night, and someone gave you a Bible. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how a man could figure out what the cherubim are by just using the Bible and not having to result to someone telling him what they are. So you went to Genesis as a new Christian, and you read the first two chapters where it mentioned the formation of the entire cosmos. Isn't that strange? The entire universe gets created by God and only took two measly little chapters to mention it. And the way God mentions it, it's with some sort of a, oh, by the way, attitude. In Genesis 1.16, it says, He made the stars also. How's that for detail? And we don't mean to be sarcastic, but it makes us realize something. God takes just two chapters for the creation of the universe, yet later on he spends seven chapters on how to make a tent. This ought to tell the Christian something. It tells the Christian that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. You don't think the way God thinks. This is one of the many reasons why mankind has been trying to rewrite the Bible as often as they can. But you get through the first two chapters, and you head for chapter 3. You read all about the fall of man, and this crazy serpent shows up. And just as Adam is getting thrown out of the garden, something shows up called cherubims and a flaming sword. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, you know what a sword is, and you know what the word flaming means, but there's nothing, nothing in that verse to tell you what cherubims are. But you feel confident. You think that an explanation will appear in the very next verse, but... That is the very last verse in the chapter. You check the next chapter, but nothing. Then the next chapter after that, but nothing. You even make it all the way through the book of Genesis, but they aren't mentioned anymore. You, you soon give up on getting an answer and start the next book of the Bible, which is Exodus. And after reading about Moses and Pharaoh and the Red Sea, you make it all the way to Exodus chapter 25, verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. All of a sudden, God tells Moses to make two cherubims of gold and place them on this box called the Ark of the Covenant. But God doesn't tell Moses what they look like. Yet Moses and his carpenters seem to know all about cherubims. He keeps talking about them. When you get to verse 20, you find out that cherubim have wings. And that's not all. We find out that all of this is done in preparing mankind to realize that God wants to be with us. And although we don't have any surviving photographs of what the mercy seat looked like, this is an artist's illustration of what it might have looked like. Now, many sculptors have tried to imagine this, but they are all just good guesses. In the next chapter, that's Exodus 26, God tells them to put cherubims on the fabric of the tent. They were putting these cherubims everywhere, and nobody stops to ask or clear their throat or ask God, um, excuse me, what do cherubims look like? And this period of time comes over 2,000 years since those cherubims showed up back in the Garden of Eden. So think about that for a second. Adam and Eve saw the cherubims, and they must have told that painful story to their children, and the grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and for the next 1,656 years, anybody could have gone and seen for themselves the flaming sword and the cherubims. 
God didn't destroy the tree of life, so man couldn't get to it. He moved the man out. So it remained there as a reminder of what is lost. This happened until the flood. Now the Garden of Eden has been covered up by mud and rain from the flood, so that no trace of it is there for us to stumble into. And now the Tree of Life is no longer there. The cherubims are no longer standing there on guard duty, keeping mankind out. So for years, the great-great-grandchildren of Adam could have visibly seen the entrance to the garden and the flaming sword and the cherubim. The people living back then knew what cherubim were. They passed that information down to each other, but it didn't make it to you, did it? Fortunately, the Bible tells us enough about it so we can get the idea. And after the flood, until the time Moses is told to make a tent, is roughly 850 years of people telling their children what cherubim look like. So this concept would still be fresh in people's minds. Now let's jump forward in time. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. Here David tells us that a cherub is like God's limousine, or taxi cab, if you will. And a cherub is kind of like God's chauffeur. David is telling us this, and it's about 3,000 years after the cherubim showed up. Not only that, but David's son Solomon made the temple, and inside he put these huge 15-foot-tall cherubims made out of wood and covered with gold. Here's another artist's rendering. In 1 Kings chapter 6, it describes how one wing of a cherubim was stretched out touching a wall, and then the other wing was stretched out touching the wingtip of another cherubim, and that other cherubim had a wing touching the other wall. Kind of like a word problem, so you could teach your children the Bible and do math problems at the same time. Now, how did Solomon know what they looked like? It appears that everyone was very familiar with what they looked like. Now, at some point, you might get frustrated in your Bible study. That happens to a lot of us. You might go to a search engine or some sort of Bible software and type in the word cherubims because you're getting frustrated. You're not finding the word cherubim show up enough. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against search engines. I think they are very useful. I use them myself. And before search engines, we old-timers used to use something called a concordance. But the problem with the search engine and a concordance is it only helps you find the exact word cherubim or cherub. If you only used a search engine, you would miss Ezekiel chapter 1 and you would miss the entire book of Revelation. The cherubim show up in Ezekiel chapter 1 and the book of Revelation, but they aren't named cherubs or cherubim in those books. They are named creatures or beasts, but they are cherubim, and those are the ones we've been looking for this whole time. Search engines are wonderful, but nothing beats the old-fashioned page-turning Bible study. So, as a new Christian, you keep reading your Bible, and you keep trying to avoid using outside sources of information, books that are not in the Bible. Then one day you make it to Ezekiel chapter 1. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. In chapter 1, verse 4, a whirlwind shows up, and it's kind of like the whirlwind that showed up in the book of Job. Now I want you to read verse 5. Note the word creatures, which would not have shown up if you just used a search engine on a computer. Keep in mind that you are a Christian wanting to study the subject of cherubims, and you have been on the lookout for something that has wings. Could this be it? So far, so good. These creatures just might be cherubim, so you start to take notes. Now, these cherubim have wings, and you knew it couldn't be angels because angels don't have wings. And every time an angel shows, shows up, he's immediately mistaken for just being a man. You find out there are four of these creatures, and they all have four faces and four wings. And the faces are of a lion, an ox, an eagle and a man. And you have a hard time visualizing that. And so you cheat. 
you go ahead and look on the internet for an illustration of what these things are. Come on, admit it, you've done it. Now, if you look for artist renderings of what these cherubims look like, you will be sadly disappointed. However, there's a pretty good one drawing out there on the internet, and here it is. Although you don't get to see the ox face, but then again, it is very difficult to draw all four faces and for you to see all four faces at the same time in one picture. This artist did his best, but I also wanted to try my hand at illustrating one of these. So, I started with the basics. I started with what Ezekiel said, that it had the appearance of a man. So I started with a basic man appearance and shape. Now, if you saw one of these cherubim from a distance, you might mistake it for being a man. Pretend that you are lost out in the woods, and there's a lot of fog, making it difficult to see, and you see this figure off in the distance, you think to yourself, that's a man over there. So you approach him, hoping that he can help you, but as you slowly get closer, you realize that this is not a man, but some crazy-looking creature. They all have a split hoof, like a calf, but hands like a man. Then I added wings, and I decided to put a tunic, uh, basically an article of clothing on him, although no article of clothing is mentioned. I just thought I'd do that because when we get to heaven, we are given garments to wear, so I'm assuming that they also might have something, although I can't say for certain. Now, the more observant person among you might notice that I've put six wings on this cherub, and even though Ezekiel told you they have four wings. Now, we'll, be, we'll get back to that in a minute. But, we're still in the book of Ezekiel, and you are a good student of the Bible. So you took notes when you went through chapter 1. Back in chapter 1, you wrote down the four faces. You wrote down an ox, and a man, a lion, and an eagle. But you still don't know for sure if these are the cherubim, or maybe something else. Then, you get to Ezekiel chapter 10, and these four guys show up again. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 14, And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. Stop right there. Congratulations. You finally found out that these wild-looking creatures with wings are cherubims. You've been wanting to find out what these things were since Genesis chapter 3. You get so excited that you run outside and do a victory dance out in the backyard. Then your neighbor sees you and asks you, what are you so excited about? And you tell them that you finally know what the face of a cherubim looks like. And so the neighbor says, all right, tell me, what does the face of a cherub look like? And you say, according to Ezekiel, a cherub's face looks like a cherub. Hey, wait a minute. What did he mean a cherub looks like a cherub? What kind of double talk is that? So you run back in your house and pick up the Bible and you keep on reading. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Now you know the other three. But you didn't quite understand the first one. Ezekiel apparently knows what a cherub looks like, but you're still not so sure. So you go back to your notes on Ezekiel chapter 1, and you write down what Ezekiel said in chapter 10 next to it. So now all you have to do is connect the dots. You take the eagle right here and you draw a line connecting him to the eagle in chapter 1. You have a match. Then you take the lion face and you draw a line over to this lion face, and voila, you have a perfect match. Then you draw a line from the man to the man in chapter 1, and you have another perfect match. So that leaves you with only one possible choice. By default, the process of elimination, the one that has the face of a cherub, is the one that looks like an ox. So although a cherub can look like any of the four beasts at the same time, the most basic appearance of a cherub is an ox. So now think back to what Adam and Eve saw. I think they saw this. When mankind thought of cherubim, they probably thought of the ox cherub 
more than the other ones. Holy cow! Now, I say that statement in jest. That's not a statement I make usually. I, only when I do this study do I, do I say that holy cow phrase. So please don't hold that against me. You ask, why would these people make a god that looks like an ox? Well, you have to think like a pagan thinks. A pagan would like to go to heaven. Of course, their definition of heaven is much different than yours. They want to live forever and have as much pleasure as possible. To them, that's paradise. And for years, the descendants of Adam and Eve could go and look and see the cherubims. And they knew that if they could get around the cherubims, they might be able to get their hands on the tree of life and live forever and eat all the fruit they want. What the pagan needs is a God that will let them do that. So the people make a golden calf and they say, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And the devil, of course, has a five point plan. And one of those points is, I will be like the most high. The devil wants to replace God, and this golden calf replaces God. You still have to think like a pagan to understand why they do this. Think of an exclusive nightclub in some big city. The pagans want to go to that nightclub. There they think they're going to have paradise. They'd sure have a lot of fun in there, wouldn't they? This is what they truly want. They want to live forever and have as much pleasure as possible but at an exclusive nightclub they don't let everyone in do they there's usually a big tough looking security guard standing by the door and he's got a list of important people and if your name is not on the list you don't get inside unless you can make friends with the guard and one of the best ways to make a security guard like you is if you reach in your wallet and pull out a $100 bill and give it to the guy then he might let you in. That's a guy trying to buy his way into paradise. So are you starting to figure it out yet? This is how the pagan, and when I say pagan, I mean everyone that is trying to buy their way into heaven, whether it be good deeds, special prayers, giving all their money, bowing down to various religions, you name it. This is what they end up doing, whether they know it or not. They are trying to bribe the guardian of eternal life and paradise. And they are going through an ox to do it. Now, speaking of religious groups, do you know what the Pope writes out an official decree? It's called a papal bull. Have you ever heard of the term sacred cow in India? They have cows running around all over the place, and nobody can disturb them because they are worshipped. That's crazy. Half the country is starving to death, and nobody fires up a barbecue. Now, when two men are lying to each other, maybe they're telling fish stories, and they both know they're lying, they call that shooting the bull. And when you claim someone is lying, don't you say they're full of bull? In fact, if you get real mad at them, you're liable to curse at them using the word bull, followed by a word for excrement, meaning that you are declaring everything they say is false and is foul. Kind of like it came out of the bull himself, the great liar. Now, some of you are nitpickers, like I am. And you'll sit patiently while someone gives you a theory. And so far, I've been giving you a wild theory. But there's something in you that says, well, it sounds interesting, but do you have any scripture to back it up? Go to the book of Psalms, chapter 106, verse 19 and 20. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus, they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They made this golden calf with an ox in mind. They were thinking of an ox, and they aren't the only one. When the twelve tribes split up into two sections... King Jeroboam 
made two calves of gold and said, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. People back then knew what a cherub looked like. It looked like an ox. And they were willing to deal directly with the cherub than the true God. Take the Ammonites, for instance. This is their god, Molech. Now, you know how to worship Molech. You sacrifice your children to him. Remember that guy paying $100 to get into the nightclub? The person trying to work their way into paradise, and not everyone gets in. Here is the god Chemosh. This god is worshipped by the Moabites. You would place your baby in the hands of Chemosh, and that baby would burn to death. And I don't know if you can tell or not, but on the left of the picture is a bunch of musicians. To put it in the modern vernacular, they're playing loud rock music or rap or dance club music or whatever is in fashion at that time so that mommy and daddy don't hear the screams of the baby. We find idols of bulls with wings from time to time. This one is made out of metal and later they would make the face out of ivory. And the Assyrians also were in on the act. These are the Assyrian cherubim. They are now located in the British Museum. Did you ever notice the Antichrist is said to be good for business, and he'll cause craft to prosper? And, of course, today, when things are going good in the stock market, we call it a bull market. But enough of what the heathen nations are up to. Let's get back to the Bible. Yeah, I want to draw your attention back to these four cherubim. Let's take the one that looks like a man. It's pretty easy to figure out who he represents back on earth. He represents all of mankind. Now let's take the eagle. It's pretty easy to figure out who he represents on earth. He represents all of the flying creatures, all birds and fowl. Now let's take a look at the lion cherub. He represents all of the animals that we would consider predator type, or maybe animals that have a furry paw or a foot. And the ox represents all of the grazing animals. And that in itself is a pretty good representation of all the animal kingdoms here on earth, except for one thing. There's a huge gap of animals that don't fall into any of those classifications, and some of you have already guessed it. The reptilian animals aren't represented. This is why the devil is called a serpent and a dragon. He'll also represent amphibians such as frogs. You'll recall that in Revelation 16:13 it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So you remember when I came up with earlier about what a cherub looked like, I couldn't resist trying to see what the serpent might have looked like as a cherub, and I came up with this. Now, it's not a perfect representation of what uh, the devil looked like, uh, of course, because he also had musical instruments throughout his body, and he was covered with precious stones and full of beauty. Now, try as I might, there was no way I was going to be able to make this thing look beautiful, but the Bible calls him a red dragon, and being a cherub, he sometimes looks like this and takes the face, takes on the face of, and the appearance of the others as we've seen earlier. There have been two other artist renderings that I've been able to track down. This one showing Lucifer as an ox cherub covered with precious stones, but as you can see, no artist depiction is going to cover everything. And this illustration showing the other cherubim with multiple faces. And just on a side note, we shouldn't be too surprised to find horned serpents in the wild. Now, some of you have wondered, why does John in the book of Revelation say they have six wings when Ezekiel says they have four wings? Now, this, this sort of subject in detail could be argued about amongst Christians, so I, I'm just going to give you what, what I think is going on here. Here are the differences. Ezekiel says four wings. John says six wings. Ezekiel says there were wheels. John doesn't mention any wheels. Ezekiel says they are moving. John sees them stationary. Ezekiel says they had each other's face at the same time, and John sees them having their own faces. Near as I can figure out, when they are stationary and showing John around, they have six wings and their own face. When they are moving the throne of God or in motion, they seem to lose two wings, or basically these two wings get connected with each other. They kind of contribute them to the group, 
and they get contributed to the other cherubim and they get moving with those wings. They each give up two wings and these wings get jointly used by all four of them so that they can turn into these wheels like some sort of wild flying saucer. Now, please excuse me for calling it that, but that or something similar to that appears to be happening. And when they get traveling, they take on the appearance of each other's face at the same time, and they have eyes all around them and can see in many directions. Perhaps a simple way to describe this is if you were to spin a yo-yo very fast, eventually it would appear as a wheel, but this is an oversimplification, though. They seem to have a changing job description. One minute they are guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden, and later they are God's taxi cab and are traveling around. Later, they are John's escort in heaven. Hey, John, welcome to heaven. Come over here and let me show you around. Check out this TV screen we got. I'll tune it into the Earth channel and show you what's going on down there on Earth in the future. So to sum up, around that throne are four cherubim. They have one thing in common. They all have feet like a calf. These four cherubim have four separate faces. And when these cherubim pick up the throne and bring it back to the earth at the second advent, which is what Ezekiel had a vision of in Ezekiel chapter 1, they will assimilate each other's faces so that each one will have four faces. Originally, there was a fifth cherub who was over the throne. Now, most people just assume that the devil is a fallen angel, but he wasn't an angel. He was a cherubim. And there used to be five of them that we know about from Scripture. And although he's got musical instruments as part of his makeup, this does not make him the choir director of heaven necessarily. Although this might have been one of his duties, we aren't told specifically. So be careful when you repeat that. This cherub looked like a man, as cherubim do, had a split foot like a calf, which all cherubim have, had a face like an ox with horns on his head. This anointed cherub that covered the throne is Lucifer. He is sometimes drawn as a character that looks like a man with horns on his head and split feet and a serpent's tail. The devil is often drawn in cartoon form as being colored red because the Bible calls him a red dragon. Now, people may laugh at the cartoon versions or depictions of the devil, but a lot of that is based on facts about how he looked at one time or another although I think my rendering is probably a little bit more biblically accurate, but more importantly is how he appears today. We Christians know that when he appears, he doesn't show himself to look like that, but instead appears as a smart and well-cultured holy man, a false Christ. Originally, the fifth cherub covered and, and it covered the throne, and he appeared in a brilliant halo of light, and he was covered from head to foot with precious stones, full of wisdom and beauty, and geographically being over the throne of God, he was worshipped by Aaron in the form of a golden calf, he was worshipped by Jeroboam in the form of a golden calf, and was worshipped as an ox by a Baal worshipper throughout the Old Testament, and the winged bull idols on Assyrian monuments. Now even though we know what the devil is, he doesn't show up like that. He doesn't appear as a red dragon. He tries his best he tries his best to appear as a holy man, a man of God. And the Bible says he appears as an angel of light. And in the Bible, angels always appear as men. So this man would have the appearance of light. He would seem to be intelligent. And when someone is really smart, we say they are bright with bright ideas. An angel of light, a holy man, a spiritual genius. And he will say, for you to get to paradise, you need to go through him. So make him happy, and he'll let you into the new age. An age of peace and long life. Basically a lot of promises, but it will all be a bunch of, well, you know what.